burdens of my heart were rolled away. We're going to sing it the cross this morning. We'll sing verse 1, 2, and 4. just love you. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to come here to worship you and to fellowship you freely and to fellowship with each other. Dear Lord, I just want to pray as Mike brings this service this morning, Lord, I pray that you'll just open our hearts and our minds, Lord. Lord, because we know that we need to hear what he's going to say today, Lord. Lord, it's so amazing. Dear Lord, I would just pray that as we take up this offer and we just, we just pray that you'll bless each gift and each giver, Lord. Lord, we pray that you'll, you'll be the, with us through this day, Lord. Lord, help us to remember our Sunday school, Lord, our lessons, Lord. We pray that you'll just, just be with this service. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this mercy and this grace, and the grace that you give us, Lord. We love you, and we praise you. In your name I pray. Amen.
going to ask the young people, if they would, to come on up this morning. All right, guys, come on up here. Everybody slide up closer. Come on in. Come on in. All right, good to see you. What do you guys think I'm going to do at the end of this children's sermon? What am I going to do? What do we always do? We pray, and then what? Get gummy snacks. Now, any of you like gummies? Boy, we do. We've done so many sermons and worked gummies in, haven't we? And the old people out there are wondering, how many times can we work them into a service anymore? But you know what? Gummies are what you love right now, right? And there are other things that the older people love that they're only going to equate to you loving gummies. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take these gummies and I'm going to put them in the middle of all of you guys. Now, how many people want them? All right, I'm going to tell you what I want, okay? And I'm just asking you just, just because um, I'm giving them to you and I'm wanting to give them to you. My one wish is that you guys don't take these until we're done, okay? Even if I sit them in the middle of you, okay? So I'm going to sit them right here. I don't know about sitting them beside of Miss Holly. So I'm going to set them right here. There they are. hard really to focus on anything when they're sitting there like that, isn't it? You want to look at them and you want them, don't you? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Hold on a second. Mike can do something about this. I might can see. Blake, can you help me? Mm-hmm. All right. Let me tell Blake something. All right. Let me cut my mic off. Now I'm going to give Pastor Blake a chance to speak. All right? You know what? What? I think you should get those gummies. I think it would be a good idea if you put your hands in there and got the gummies. Pastor Mike, I think, told me to get the gummies. Told you guys you could get the gummies. You want them? Yes. You can get them. I want all of them. You can get them. Guys, most of you didn't even get the gummies. Why didn't you get the gummies? But Pastor Blake told you that you could. Why was it wrong? Because you heard what I said to begin with? All right. Hand me the gummies. Hand me the gummies. No, hand me the box of gummies. All right. All right. Listen. Listen. I got to tell you something. I am so proud of you guys. You know why? You knew what I really, really wanted. Who was really giving you the gummies? Me. And I'm the one that told you that you couldn't. Even though Pastor Blake stood up and told you that I said that you could, you didn't do it because you didn't know. Was there that nervous feeling like, should I, shouldn't I, I don't know whether I should? Listen, I want to tell you something today. Even though it's gummies, that's exactly what you're going to keep going through in life. Even the old people out here, they can tell you this. Listen, They have things they're thinking about that are different than gummies. Here's what happens. You see, that's just me telling you. And I'm not God. 
I'm just your pastor, but you, you respected what I said and you didn't take them because you knew that unless I told you you could, then you couldn't. But guess what? God tells you things all through the Bible. And the Bible tells you what to do and what not to do. How many people know the Bible tells you right from wrong? But do you know that even before you read the Bible, you know what's right and what's wrong, don't you? You know what to do and what not to do. How many people think that being mean to somebody is right? How many think being mean to somebody is wrong? Me. Right. How many people think uh, disobeying your parents is wrong? Yep. How many people think hating somebody is wrong? Right. You know that. How many people think stealing something is wrong? Right. You know that. And if you, if you know that, then there's something inside of you that tells you it's wrong. But what if somebody else tells you it's okay to steal or it's okay to talk back? Or what if everybody starts talking back to their parents and everybody starts disobeying? Well, then you're going to start thinking that it's right. Listen, I'm here to tell you today, it's no different than gummies for the rest of your life. The same way I told you this, there's going to be people that come in your life that are going to tell you that doing those things that are sin, they're going to tell you those things are okay. But you can't, you can't listen to them if God tells you it's wrong, then it's what? It's wrong. If God tells you it's right, then it's what? Right. right. And you learn those things in church. You learn it from reading your Bible, but you know in your heart that right and wrong. Now, Pastor Blake, he just helped me do this example. He's never going to tell you anything wrong. And I'm never going to tell you anything wrong. But if I or he ever tell you anything that goes against the Bible, then who do you need to believe? You need to believe the Bible. You need to believe what God says always because he's the only one that's always right. So whatever you hear needs to go along with what God says is right and wrong because it's gummies right now. But when you grow up and as you get older and you can ask these, un ask these old people out here. Hey, old people. How many of you have known something was wrong? But then as everybody began to think it was okay or right, it was easier to do those things. Raise your hand. Look at that. See? That's what's going to happen. So it's going to do you well to know what God said is right and wrong. And where are we going to learn that at? We're going to read what? The Bible. All right. And then there's going to be that voice of God that speaks inside of us. So who do you want to listen to? Somebody tell me. You. Nope, not just me. Who else do you want to listen to? Exactly. You want to listen. And I'm going to tell you about Jesus. So yes, you do want to listen to me, but you want to make sure that the Bible tells you what you need to know and that the voice of God that tells you right from wrong, you'll know it. You'll have that same feeling you just had when everybody was like, do I get it? Do I not get it? Should I get it? Should I not get it? Well, when you get ready to sin, it's going to be that same thing going on. Always do what God tells you to do. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for this day. I thank you for these children. I thank you, Lord, for their minds being set on you. I thank you, Lord, already for their level of respect and knowledge to know not to go against something they feel is wrong. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, here you go. I got gummies for you guys. I told you I was going to give them to you then. You knew I was, right? Here you are. Mm -hmm. Yep, there you go. Did you want to say them? I know. Here you go. There you are. You're welcome. Here you go. No, you got to give one to Salem. There you go. There you go. There you go. I tell you, there's a lot in a children's sermon. Things sometimes that I don't expect. Early service, we had the same children's sermon, and once they were given the okay, when Blake said, Pastor Mike said you could do them, well, we had sort of a free-for-all, everybody getting them. <laughs> but this is pretty strong, because what you were able to see is that there's a clear knowledge of right and wrong. 
there's a clear knowledge of, I'm nervous, I don't know whether to do it, uh, maybe I should do it, maybe I, I shouldn't do it. You can hear that voice while you're here, and you can even hear it when you're away. Parents that have just sent children off to college, you want to make sure they can hear that voice while they're away, right? Amen. You're not there to just tell them this, tell them that anymore. When your children are at school, you want to make sure they can hear it there. And we want to make sure we can hear it, right? Today, I want to talk to you about something that I believe is threatening, that voice of God. Not just to us individually, but to us individually, to us as a group, to us as a society. But I don't want to preach opinion to you. I want to preach God's word to you. So if you have... A copy of God's Word. If you have your Bible, please stand and raise it above your head. Bear witness of God's Word. That way we know the authority that this will come from. Amen. You may be seated. Turn, if you would, to the book of Amos. You say, Amos, is that a book in the Bible? <laughs> it is a book in the Bible. Turn to Amos. You'll find Amos right before the book of Obadiah. You'll find Obadiah before the book of Jonah. So turn to the book of Amos, if you will, please. Amos was a minor prophet that spoke on behalf of God. Amos was speaking to the children of Israel, knowing that they had a history of being obedient to God and then turning away, and being obedient to God and turning away, and listening to what the prophet or the scriptures would tell them and then listening to someone misinterpret the scriptures or doing what they felt like they wanted to do because it felt good. You know, we have things that feel good, things that we really want to do that go against what God wants us to do. Can I get a witness? Anybody ever experienced those things? So Amos was writing this. I want you to listen to these two verses. It'll be our springboard. Amos chapter 5. Listen to verse 14 and 15. This command. First, these five words. Seek good and not evil. Can you say that with me? Seek good and not evil. One more time. Seek good and not evil. That is pretty self-explanatory, right? Seek good and not evil. Even though we struggle with it, he says seek good and not evil. Now listen, here's the reason why. That you may live. And so the Lord... The God of hosts shall be with you as you have spoken. Why should you seek good and not evil? So that you can live. So that you can live in fellowship with the Lord. So that you can recognize who God is and let Him do all those things He wants to do as far as protection, provision, blessings, favor. Now listen to verse 15. He gets stronger. Hate the evil, and love the good. Now can you say those six words with me? Actually, seven if you count and. Ready? Hate the evil. And love One more time. So we're told to seek good and not evil. We're told to hate the evil and love the good. He says, and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Understand that, to summarize this verse as a springboard, these were instructions given to God's people, God's chosen people. He said we needed to seek good, not to seek evil. He told us that we're supposed to hate evil, and love the good. He told us what that would benefit us and how it would benefit them. We've realized that in a nation that was founded upon the basic principles of God. We're blessed to live in a nation that was founded upon the basic principles of God. And because of that, not that every person in this nation is a Christian, every person is a believer, but we've been blessed that we are under the umbrella blessing of God, which means that because we set forth 
our laws instituted on the moral law of God and instituted on what God said was right and wrong, then God has blessed us, even those that were just a part of it. But he told us something interesting here that we seem to be going against today. And this has been on my heart so much that the devil has battled me relentlessly on this sermon all week, through the weekend, last night, this morning, everything from we're going to have a deacon ordination service at the end of the service. This has nothing to do with deacon ordination, but this has everything to do with service. So it's on my heart and need to speak it. I realize it won't be the most popular sermon, but I think it's a very needed sermon. For those that are here that have never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will have an aversion to the sermon because you won't be spoken to by the Holy Spirit the way that someone saved is, but you will be spoken to by the Holy Spirit that lets you see if you're not saved, if you're outside of His voice. And I, I start by saying, because I want to make sure that every time I preach the Word of God, I share the gospel. If you're here today and you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, or you're just not sure, and maybe you've grown up in church, and maybe you're a good person, maybe you know and believe that there is a God, and historically you believe that there is a Jesus. That belief alone is not enough to get you in fellowship with God. It's not enough to save you from hell. It's not enough to get you to heaven. What you have to believe on is what Jesus did and God's love to give his son to die for you. Jesus being perfect, the only one without sin, and us being sinners. The only way that we could get to God was through Jesus' atoning death. We have to use the blood of his sacrifice to cover our sins. Now, we can't just go out and reach and get that blood. We, we get that by believing, by asking God to forgive us as sinners, admitting that we're sinners, and then saying, God, I believe Jesus died for me as my way to get to you. Please forgive my sins. Use his blood to cover my sins. Let Jesus be my Savior. Save me from the condemnation that I'm facing. That's what being saved means. And if you haven't done that today, then you'll realize that you're outside of the family of God. It's not what society tells you, that we're all just children of God. Now, the person that have done it, they're no better people. They're still sinners. They're just saved sinners. They're not elite people. They just happen to be people who have believed. So today, as we read this, and we go over this topic, I want you to be able to see that even Christian people can hear the wrong thing or be in the middle of a wrong ideology and they can begin. Well, actually, they'll begin to reword the voice of God. They'll begin to disobey the voice of God. And as they do it, the next generation will do it even more. And as they do it, the next generation will do it even more. I use the word selectively in Amos 5, or the phrase I want to use it, hate the evil. We think as Christians we're not supposed to hate anything, right? But he tells us to hate what? Evil. Now listen to what the psalmist said in Psalms 97.10. And you can write this, I'll just quote it to you but you can write it on your notes this is the psalmist ye that love the lord hate evil he preserveth the soul of his saints he delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked that's what he does Amen. that's what god does and you know what he asked you to do Amen. you say he asked me to love hold on he didn't ask you to love in this verse he says, ye that do love already, I'm asking you to hate. He said, oh, where have we landed? What kind of sermon are we going to hear? He's not asking you to hate any person. He's asking you to hate what? Somebody tell me. Tell me again. Was it clear in those verses? Elementary almost, right? Hate the evil. You see, a lot of people think today that if you're a Christian, then you're supposed to love everything. We've wrapped all the attributes of God up into a big box and we've said that God is love. 
We have to. As a society accepted the idea that society puts forth that says no matter what person or what behavior of a person that we encounter, no matter what belief that we encounter, no matter what action we encounter, no matter what situation that we encounter that goes against our beliefs, we're supposed to accept it in love because God is love. And we're supposed to lovingly accept everyone and lovingly accept everyone's lifestyle or belief because to accept them and to accept their lifestyle and to accept their belief is to love them. Is that what you're hearing in society today? I realize this is going to be geared towards Christians. But as I said, those who have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to realize the Word of God will find you where you're at. He'll speak to you through this. And I don't apologize for it. Before I preach this, I recognize, I think I mentioned to Pastor Blake, I said this will be the one, one of the ones that they'll use at my trial. <laughs> and I'm serious. But I will tell you this. I take the business of pastoring seriously. That God calls me to be the under-shepherd of a flock. Do I deserve it? No. There's a lot of grace went into that. Am I qualified? No. But I was called. So what the shepherd does, a lot of times he feeds, a lot of times he protects, but a large amount of the time his responsibility is to look outside of the sheep and see what's coming in to attack the sheep. Because if the sheep get lulled asleep from it, then the flock will scatter. The little ones will be eaten up. You see, this idea that I just gave to you is an idea that seems to be dictating our new rules of society. Whether it be our laws or our workplace rules or our public education system policies or even church policies. This idea has begun to dictate everything that we see and think. And well, it's been named, a beautiful name that stands for loving everything and accepting everything and everybody. A name that says we're not to judge and nothing's wrong. You're just supposed to let someone be who they are. And this word is tolerance. No matter which day you choose to watch the news, you'll see someone or some group who is restructuring their beliefs or policies or laws because they are afraid of being labeled intolerant. And if there's some person or group that refuses to respect the belief of someone else because it goes against their belief, then that person or group is labeled as a hate group or as a person that hates instead of loves. You see that, right? You realize that evangelical Christians are being labeled as hate groups. Because if the devil can get them into that group, then he can structure laws against them. We're getting back to our original prayer that started the service for thank you for the freedom of letting us worship. This is a big deal, guys. It doesn't start by just some decree that comes down. It starts a little at a time and goes a little and a little and a little more. How crazy has it become? We even have groups and associations today that have begun to dictate right and wrong, that have no biblical premise at all. When you have the National Basketball Association dictate that because a place is not as tolerant as they think they need to be, we're going to offer judgment and punishment and move funds from them because we don't see it that way so because of this i took the time to look through the old and new testament this past week and never saw the nba mentioned as an authority anywhere 
And I have to tell you that we've become so ridiculously enslaved to pleasures and these things that we could even let this be something that we could hear. And the other side is the power that lies within this is a, is a power of persuasion that persuades people that if they are intolerant to anything, that they're showing an absence of love. But the hypocrisy of that statement is all those who are standing on their beliefs are punished because the group that's claiming to be tolerant are intolerant of those beliefs that go against their beliefs. Don't want to bring this up, but a third grader could figure that out. Why in the world are we blinded by it? So, what I want to see us do today is, I want us to use God's Word for us to be able to see that, yes, God is the God of love but that he's a loving God that has made it clear that God is an intolerant God. An intolerant God. Yes, I said the bad word, intolerant. And I cannot stand here and tell you not to be intolerant if I see in God's word that he made it clear there were things that he was intolerant of. What I want us to see through his word today and through the examples given in his word is that he expects us to love just like he loved. But that he also expects us to be intolerant of the things that he is intolerant of. You don't have to look far in the Bible to be able to see story after story beginning with the children of Israel once they had entered the promised land and Joshua was leading them through. God says, hey, go take possession of the land. And by the way, any of those pagan nations that worship other gods and don't believe in other gods, don't you associate with them. Don't you spare them. Don't you do this. Because before long, you'll end up intermarrying, accepting their ideas, and this is what will happen. Well, they disobeyed that. And because of that, you have the book of Judges where they completely fail time after time after time because they begin to be tolerant of the ideas that the godless people would bring. Whether you want to call that loving them or what, the society would fail. Definition of tolerance, according to the dictionary, is a readiness to allow others to believe or act as they judge best. Another definition, a respect for the belief of a Behavior of others without necessarily sharing or agreeing with them. To be tolerant is to be willing to tolerate the beliefs and way of living of others that you do not agree with. To tolerate is to accept the actions of others without dispute. And you know there are thousands of examples in life. In our own personal way that we think things should be. There are things that yes, we should be tolerant of other people in. Because it's our opinion of something and somebody else's opinion. And as far as tolerating another person because they are who they are, whether they were born a certain way or or born here, or they speak a different language, or they have this going on, you're never called to be intolerant to that person. What you're called to be intolerant to is anything that goes against God's truths so you can't find those opinion things in god's truth you might try to manipulate and wrap the scriptures around them i'm talking about the things that are in god's truth see tolerance today has taken a new definition you didn't think they would stay with this just respect of something you don't believe tolerance today has a new definition the definition today seems to be giving everyone and everything equal space to be right or acceptance of all views and actions is equally true That would be today's definition. What is really wrong in today's society? Everything is glorified. The most heinous sin is glorified. Blatant sexual immorality is glorified. 
Everything's glorified. Why? Well, because we became tolerant to it. You didn't want to offend the person that did it. You didn't want to label them or put them somewhere because it wasn't acting in love. Now, the tolerant person today claims to be open-minded. The tolerant person today claims to be a, a broad thinker. While they go out of their way to accept something that God has said is wrong or evil so that they can show their tolerance. There's a campaign going the other way that says, yes, if God said it's wrong, where is it at? Let me say I'm okay with it. You say, is this a big deal? It's a pretty big deal because right now when you talk about broad thinking, when you think about open-minded, realize that the majority of the classrooms today, and thank God for godly teachers, but the majority of the, the classrooms today and college campuses, this is the agenda that is encouraged because you are told in order to be as intellectual as you want to be, in order to be as broad a thinker as you need to be, then you need to be open-minded enough to be tolerant of all these things and not depend on what some old ancient book has said. But what we need to realize today is that you can love like God loves, but also be intolerant like God is intolerant. God will never call you to hate a person. Never will. We use the term, hate the sin, love the sinner. That's a good term. It's used a whole lot. It doesn't really help us identify with our problem we're facing, though. What do we do? Well, the Bible answers those questions. You see, to be intolerant is not to accept the action of others that go against what you believe. You understand? That's the definition of intolerant. To be intolerant is not accepting the actions of others that go against what you believe. What do you mean, not accepting it? Not accepting it is not respecting it. Not accepting it is not going along with it. Not accepting it is taking a stand against it. You see, we have a double standard here. We have rules in our homes, things that we say, this is, this is what time you need to be in. This is what you need to do. This is how we're going to do it. And there's a lot of intolerance in homes. We do that with our children, right? I won't tolerate this. This is what I expect. But yet, in open-mindedness, we've left the Bible open as fair game to say, we'll tolerate this and tolerate that in the name of love. <laughs> well, do you love your children? You know that you require them to be in a certain time at night because you do love them? Are you guaranteed they'll do something wrong if they stay out that late? Nope even though nothing good does happen after 12 o'clock. You're welcome, parents. I just threw that in. I didn't want to think. It's just coming from you guys. That's coming from parents that were out after 12 o'clock at night, right? So, you love your children and you're intolerant of some of their behavior, right? You don't think that the Heavenly Father, God that loves you, would be intolerant of your behavior? Why? Because He loves you. Because he knows that sin separates you from him. So he's intolerant. So he wrote these rules down in this book we call the Bible. And that's not the only place that they are. And we'll see that. Why did he give us these things that were right and wrong? Because he is intolerant. Why is he intolerant? Because he loves. See, they do go together. It's not the opposite. You're being sold a pack of lies that say, if you love, you'll be tolerant. No, if you love, you'll be intolerant. God knows that my sin separates me from him. So what he needs to do is put something in place that says, you can't keep, I, I love you so much, I don't want you to be separated. My love makes me say, I won't stand for this. Come on, brother. That. You see, to be biblically intolerant means that you do not accept the things that go against biblical truths. So when somebody asks you, are you intolerant? 
you need to be able to answer them and say, I'm biblically intolerant. What does that mean? That means I'm not going to go against what the Bible says is wrong. God tells us that we're supposed to be intolerant of sin. And basically the easiest definition I can give you of sin, of sin is what God said is wrong. How about that? Is that easy? When we look at his word, we see that it's wrong to have any other God besides him. Anybody ever see that in his word? We see, secondly, it's wrong for us to worship any other God. You ever see that in his word? What about it's wrong to murder? Ever see that? What about it's wrong to steal? Ever see that? What about it's wrong to lie? See that? Commit adultery, right? There's just six of the Ten Commandments we know are wrong. God put his mind. You say, it's Old Testament. You're just trying to make it right to you. That was God's mind then, it's God's, mind's na- God's mind now. It was wrong then, it's wrong now. He's a God that doesn't change. So was it wrong? Yes. Did God say he would stand for it? No. God hates sin. So what makes us think we can? You see, the Bible tells us clearly the things that we're addressing today, which we've got a lot more things that we're intolerant to, but if I were to pick some out and things you expect me to address, the the hot button subjects today. If you were to look in the book of Leviticus and the book of Romans, you would see that homosexuality is wrong. The Bible tells you it's an abomination. The book of Romans says, hey, it's when you leave the natural affection. God didn't make you this way. It's wrong. The Bible tells us there's not only that's wrong, it tells us that adultery is wrong, fornication is wrong. You know what that means? That means fornication is sex outside of marriage. Fornication means that you're living as if you're married, but you're not married. There's no covenant. Not legally. There's no covenant to God. There's no covenant legally. So you're living outside of marriage. But today it's accepted by society because society has become tolerant to it. We've even geared the laws that say if you do it long enough, we're just going to say it's right but what it gives us is a society with no commitment you want to get back to how many children are raised without fathers in the homes and see the degradation of society because of something we've tolerated take a look and see some of these moms that wish they had a man around because he went in and he did the living together but there was no covenant there was no commitment I understand it can happen in marriage but God didn't design it that way when you go against what God designs it's wrong he hates it it's going against his order so understand that society does not have the trump card man does not have all the knowledge the knowledge comes from God the truth comes from God when you are tolerant to biblical if you tolerate things that go against biblical truths then you're going to see the breakdown of any society that does that and the breakdown of any home and the breakdown of any person oh here's another one and the breakdown of any church while we're on the subject The Bible speaks repeatedly about sexual immorality as a sin. That seems to be the thing that is being championed today. Sexual immorality, the Bible speaks a lot about it. You know why? Because it's the gummies that everybody wants. If you put yourself in that children, you've got an urge inside of you. It's a natural urge. You want to feed that urge. It's the gummies that everybody wants. And then if somebody gives you a right to that, And all of a sudden, it's not wrong, and you have another voice that comes in and says, let me explain it this other way. And listen, you're not loving somebody if you're not accepting that, then it becomes something that society begins to accept. Can you believe that we are actually debating on whether it's okay for a man or woman to change the way that God made them and the way that they want to appear so that they can express themselves, and if you choose not to, you're a hater. Can you believe that idealism? You say, well, yeah, yeah, that's just, that's just what it is, so give me some biblical truth, okay? There's a book called Deuteronomy where God said, I want to make it clear, I'm going to go over a bunch of things here that are right and wrong, so that you won't have any kind of question that I said it's wrong. Try on Deuteronomy 5.22. Write that down in your Bibles. You might want to use this in your break room. Deuteronomy 5.22. You ready? Listen to it. 
Write it down. I'm going to read it to you, but listen to it. See if it sounds clear or vague to you. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garments, for all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. That's going to be in your oldest copy of the Bible. Deuteronomy, man. That's what Jesus quoted to the devil. Deuteronomy. What does it say? God said, I don't want the lines blurred at all. It's not allowed. I didn't make them that way. You don't dress that way. Not pretend to be that way. You don't even dress that way. Don't pretend that way. What does that mean? Well, that means that that's what God says. You said, oh, you've got this preacher up there huffing and puffing about that. No, I'm preaching God's word this morning. If you're rejecting it, you're rejecting the word of God. You're not rejecting my word. My feelings won't get hurt. Hey, come on, man. This is God's word. He takes a stand against it. So I'm here to ask you today, in a day where the agenda of tolerance is out to accept all transgender lifestyles and then cater to them by glorifying and praising those that participate in this lifestyles and condemn and criticize all those that stand against it, what have we done with God's right and wrong? What have we done with it? You say, they've done this with it. They've done that with it. No, not they. We. I'm not here to blame this invisible group of people out here. We. The devil's smooth. Nobody wants to be labeled a hater, do they? Nobody wants to be labeled intolerant. Boy, if you do right now, you, you're going you're gonna to face, you might even be on the news. You can't even be intolerant to things that just make no sense at all. Because we're living in the world of the easily offended. You see, the Bible tells us God hates sin. As we said, He hates sin because it goes against His very nature. God is holy. He has nothing to do with sin. Amen. Psalms 5.4 tells us that God takes no pleasure in wickedness and no evil dwells in Him. That means God has no sin. The Bible tells us that there is no sin in God in 1 John chapter 3. The Bible tells us in Romans 9, 14, it tells us that there is no unrighteousness with God. What does it say? God hates sin because it separates us from Him. What I think we're not getting, the message that Christians are not getting, is that God is such a loving God that he doesn't want us to be separated from him, and he doesn't want any future generation to be separated from him. So he expects us to love him and love others enough to be intolerant to sin because that sin will separate others from him. There is no hate for man in biblical intolerance. That means you're not called to hate any other human being in biblical intolerance. You're called to hate any idea that goes against sin and the acceptance of that idea. Why? Because God hates it. That's why you're called to hate it. And yes, you've seen today, you're called to hate what God hates. He says you stand for me or you stand against me. Now this umbrella has become big. We've thrown in all kinds of things in this umbrella so that we could make it what people want to make it. So that you're some bad person if, if you're having intolerant ideas. This campaign was orchestrated by the serpent himself. Romans 12, 9 says, abhor that which is evil. You know what abhor means? Tell me again out loud. Hate, hate that which is evil. Not hate and act out in some kind of a violent act. Not hate and act out by name calling or criticism. God never calls you to speak that way to someone or to act out against that person in hate. Never. You will never see it in God's word where he calls you to do that. But he calls you to stand against that sin and hate the sin. Abhor the evil. Why? Because this loving God knows that evil is going to separate you from him. 
it's going to separate that person. So if I love people, if I want somebody to be saved from a sinful position to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, if I love them, then I'm going to be intolerant to their sin. Because if I accept their sin, there's no precedent for them to change. There's no even no little voice saying, God said it's wrong. Because at the end of the day, when they get through debating you, they have to be with their own mind. And God can speak to their own mind. And He'll bring those words up. Because it's not just the biblical written word of God that convicts man. It's also man himself. These children. Hold on a second. Do you see it when they were like, oh man, there they are. Should I get them? Should I not get them? Should I get them? Should I not get them? Do you know why? They knew it was wrong to get them. Nobody wrote that out and told them, right? They knew in their heart it was wrong. You go back to our theme verse of Psalms 97.10. It says, ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked one. He wants us to, those that love the Lord, to hate evil. Why? Because hating evil and standing against and realizing that evil is what's in us. You know, we have a a heart that's wicked. Our mind is prone to these things. Well, that's why God had to save us, right? 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. Boy, we we really have a gray line there where we try to convince ourselves, well, it might look like it, but it's not. Hey, he sort of clears it up here. Abstain from any appearance of evil. You see, we're clearly told in God's word that if God thinks that it's evil, if God says it's a sin, then we are not supposed to accept it. If we're not supposed to accept it, we're not supposed to embrace it. If we're not supposed to embrace it, then by all means, we're not supposed to accommodate it. When we accommodate that kind of behavior that God calls sin, then we're condoning that sin by our tolerance. We are giving the devil exactly what he wants. He wants sin to be accepted. He wants the line to be blurred between right and wrong. He wants evil to be thought of as good and good to be thought of as evil and the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah that God is not friendly with this idea he said in Isaiah chapter 5 woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter tolerance of sin and acceptance of sin as good instead of evil is something that God said he would condemn how do you know he said woe unto them You know what he's saying? You bring this idealism into my children and those future people that would love me. You see, you might say, well, I accept it just because I know better and I need to get this done. Well, hold on a second. Will it make you feel better if I were to tell you that being tolerant, well, it might not change your ideas. You can just stand there by yourself and say, well, I, I know I put up with it, but I don't believe it. You're pretty caring people, so let's bring the next generation into it. If you're tolerant to it, do you realize that the other side's not going to stop? So the line becomes blurred. And when the line becomes blurred, the next generation sees a blurred line. I asked you a minute ago, how many people thought years ago we would even be debating what we're debating now or seeing this. 20 years ago, how many people thought we would see this? Raise your hand. You didn't, right? You didn't. You didn't think you'd see it. But we're seeing it, right? Well, what do you think the next 10 years? The next 10 years? The next 10 years? Because, hey, don't go looking at this generation that's young now that says, oh, well, not nah, this is right. You know, you guys aren't open. Don't be thinking that. It's not, it's not their fault, per se, that they're thinking this way. You know why? Because tolerance has made a way for them not even to see the right and wrong. Now, I want to share something with you. You see, you might be here and say, well, I know people I can't get through because they don't believe the Word of God. I understand that. You see, God's truths are found written in His Word and He wants us to know them, but God's truth also are revealed to men outside of his written word. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. 
The Bible says in Romans 1, verse 18 and 19, I want to read this to you because Paul was writing a pretty hard letter here. And he was trying to say, listen, no matter what excuse you think you have, here would be something that's an excuse. Well, I just think that if you love people, you don't judge them, or I, I think that you can't call it wrong, or I don't want to criticize somebody, and I don't want to hate somebody, and, and say they've got the whole wrong idea of tolerance. Listen to what Paul is saying here. He says in verse 18 and 19, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against us, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. You know what it's saying here? All those who take the truth that God speaks to us in his written word, and I'm going to show you where else, that take that truth and then hold it in unrighteousness and say, it's not really truth. What God said is right, is right. And what God calls wrong, isn't really wrong. He says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now, here's the because, verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest, that means made into them. For God has shown it unto them. Before that baby can read, the rules that say, do not take someone else's toy, and they take someone else's toy, the first thing they do is hide that they took it. Before that baby knows that it's wrong to hit and wrong to lie, they'll hit because inside they want to hit, but they'll know that it's wrong, so they'll lie about hitting. Come on. Who taught them that? Nobody has to teach them that. Because God puts inside of man what is really wrong. And as I spoke to someone this week, this verse came to mind thinking about what if this person doesn't believe this or doesn't believe this? And I, wanna, I want you to understand something. The person that has the strongest debate in the world with you, that person who is adamantly saying, well, you're wrong and, and you've got to be tolerant, you've got to be this and that, that person knows already. God has not missed that person. They know it's a right and wrong or they wouldn't be so adamantly trying to defend it. They know it's wrong and they're trying to make their, their self feel better about it. You see, it's not just written in the Word. It's written on men's heart. A moral conscience that God gives man that says, hey, it's not right to walk up and murder somebody. But here's what happens. When a society degrades and is tolerant of that, and they bring other gods to be worshipped in, and they bring other ideas that go against uh, what God said is right and wrong, they become these pagan societies which disallow anything to do with God. And before long, you will see just heinous crimes and mass social... Um, executions and you see that going on now right let me give you a little clue you want to do a little history research find all those heinous things going on in those countries go back and look and see if that country is a country devoted to God how far how far uh, how long ago it was when that country decided to disallow the word of God to stand against the word of God whether it be a communist society or a society that believes in devil worship or a society that has outlawed God's word see because they go hand in hand together because what happens is the moral conscience even God's voice that tells men right and wrong once you take God out of the picture then generation to generation to generation don't even see the right and wrong that's why people can stand Stand up and say, hey, I have no feeling at all for God. I don't feel right and wrong. Go look. There's a correlation with how far or how long ago those people disallowed God's word. Amazing, isn't it? In Romans Chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Since it's the next page over, the Bible says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, 
do by nature the things contained in the law. These, having not the law, are a law to themselves. You know what it's saying? He was talking about people that didn't even have God. People that were not Christians. He said, I'm trying to show you, they don't even have the, the law, the Ten Commandments, to tell them right and wrong, but they still do them because it's in them to do them. They know that when the child comes up, they love the child. They don't beat the child. When the person makes them upset, they might get angry, but they don't just kill the person. Why? Because the law of God's inside of them. Now listen to verse 15. He says, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also being witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. Tell me a man doesn't have a moral conscience in itself? Now here's what happens, and here's the danger. When you read in Paul's letter to Timothy, and you read Paul's first letter to Timothy, I want to read this to you. This is 1 Timothy chapter 4. Just listen to these words. Here's what happens. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. That means the Spirit speaketh clearly. That in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrine of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. What does that mean? That means generationally, that voice that society has in them as right and wrong can be seared. To where they grow up in homes that Believe that you accept everything is right. And before long, that person has a home to where even more they accept is right. I remember a different way even in the homes as far as respect went. I can remember as a child visiting. I don't know why this stands out. I wasn't even going to share it, but I'm going to. I remember visiting. This is when you used to go and visit people. Remember that? Used to get in the car and take the kids and say, hey, let's go drive and see so-and-so. We went to see someone and it was a Friday evening and I remember that those kids were a lot older than, than we were and they were going out and the parents told them something and I remember that child told his mom to shut up and, and I thought, yeah, we act like that surprises us. He told him to, to shut up and I thought the end of the world, I was like, I cannot believe that just came out of his mouth. Let me duck because I was so into it. It's just, you just don't do that. Well, those that said, ooh, you're a minority today. Even that level of respect has been taken out of homes today. Children speak to parents like that. You know why? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Why do parents speak? Because it's tolerated. tolerated why do we do what we do because we're kids with a bunch of gummies in the middle of us when it goes down to, to the very base of us we have something we want and if it's tolerated then we become more apt to do it and more apt to do it whose job is it to stop it mine yours You want to teach somebody something? Teach them the truths of God's word. That's whose job it is to stop it. Don't look at your government. Don't look at your school system. Don't look at your workplace. It didn't start there. It started in the home, guys. It started when we started tolerating sin and saying it doesn't concern me and I don't want to be a judge and society took it because the devil has been waiting to pounce on it and give this idealism that says, hey, you can't say this because it's not an act of love. I'm here today to proclaim that I love and I love somebody enough not to want them to be separated from God by their sin so I want to be intolerant of that sin I don't want to hurt that person I don't want to criticize that person I don't want to hate that person I don't want to sit and call names of that person I want to identify the sin and go to my grave saying it's sin it was sin when I did it it was sin when you're going to do it 
It was sin that separated me from God. It's sin that will separate you from God. I'm not putting myself on a pedestal. I'm not saying I'm better than you because I'm a Christian. I'm just saying I'm acknowledging sin. I'm hating sin enough to say, stay away from anybody that I love. In the same way that I would protect my children that I love. And if somebody was out to hurt them, then I would hate the act of that, that happening. I would want to keep them away from that. That's what sin does to our families. Amen. And until we recognize it for what it is. Because it's in all of us. You can't put a gate around your house and keep your house free from sin. Sin's manufactured in the mind of man. And the Bible says that the heart is desperately wicked above all things. Amen. So it's not something you can guard from. What guards you from it? The voice of the Holy Spirit of God and the truths of His written Word. Now they don't do it if they stay in you and in here. Now get this, this is the end. It doesn't happen if it stays in this book and if it stays in you. It only happens when you get it out. If nobody's standing against it, it will be tolerated. The failure to be intolerant to sin and this campaign of blanket tolerance has made its way into the churches and into Christian homes. But if we fail to be intolerant to sin, we will see the devastating effect even on on our society that once claimed to be a nation under God until that offended somebody. And now you'll be intolerant to stand against anybody. You'll be labeled intolerant to stand against anybody that refuses to acknowledge that. You see where it's come to? Here's what happens. Just listen. Romans 1. We read it a minute ago. Just listen. Because that when they knew God and glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of an incorruptible God into the image made like a corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. That's, that's saying that man believed he was a bigger authority than God. That's what we're seeing, right? The creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into which is against their nature. And likewise also men leaving their natural use of the woman burned in their lust one towards another. Men for men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient not convenient means gave them over to do things that they ought not do this is the sad thing if we don't get a handle on this by the people in this room that say they believe it by the people that are listening to this cd and amening by this minority group if we do not get a handle on this then understand this is those days if you can't draw this comparison then you're blind if you can see this understand if you don't want your next generation, your children, your children's children, and even this generation to be given over. What do you mean give them o- given over? Well, the Spirit of God that has been in man's heart and mind, this umbrella blessing that we've had in this society, knowing that we're ran by the, the voice of God that instituted these laws. If we begin to do this without a voice, while we're just keeping it in the Word, keeping it in ourselves, if we don't have a voice, if we don't show our intolerance, not by acts of violence, not by acts of hate, but if we don't show our intolerance by acts of love and telling people that we love them again enough to stand with the Word of God, if we don't do this, then this society is going to be given over to this way of thinking. That means this way of thinking will become the normal. Mm-hmm. 
So it's my job and it's your job. How are you doing your job? I'll use this time to think about myself. You use this time to think about yourself. It's one thing to sit and say that's right. It's one thing to say, yeah, I can see that. It's one thing to say, yes, he does say that. It's another thing to say, where am I with it? How am I applying it? You say it's hard. It absolutely is. When things are hard, you know who you turn to? You turn to your Heavenly Father, and you tell Him you need the strength to be able to do what He wants you to do. Let me tell you, a all-powerful, all-loving God will absolutely give you the strength to obey Him. He will not work against you. You say, you don't understand what I've got to lose. You don't understand what you've got to gain. And it's not just some spiritualization of this fact in the Bible. No, God says, I'll supply all of your needs according to his riches and glories. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He says, seek me first. I'll give you all these things. You will never fail standing with God. Standing on the promises of God, we cannot fall. We cannot fail, right? So pray with me. Father God, I love you. I praise you and I thank you for your word today. I pray, God, that you impress your word upon our hearts. Lord, I cry out for individuals. I cry out for families. I cry out for nations. I cry out for our nation. I pray, God, that our voice is not suppressed. I pray that the words of your written word, your holy word, do not stay within the cover of our Bible. I pray, God, that the word that you speak to us, Lord, our own convictions do not stay within our own voice. I pray, God, that you give us the courage, the strength, and as your children... Pray for courage and strength to stand with you, not against you. To hate what you hate because we love what you love. I pray as they ask for strength today, Lord, let a blanket of protection and strength fall upon them. Let them be empowered, God, by your presence, by your companionship. And I pray, God, that we can leave this place today knowing our position and being confident and bold enough to speak our position. I pray, God, for anyone in this room also who's never accepted your son Jesus as Savior, that today they would see their need for salvation. That today, knowing that Spirit is working in this room, they would see their self, Lord, in a position of never truly asking you for forgiveness and asking you to use the blood of your son Jesus to save them. Let them be compelled today to do that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have our invitation today. I'll be standing up front to pray with anyone here that realizes I don't think I'm saved. Maybe I'm not a child of God. I'm standing outside of the family of God. I've never accepted Jesus as my Savior. I want to pray with you. Prayer of salvation. I want you to be bold enough to know it's the most important thing you will ever do. Not because I tell you to, but because there's a voice inside of you now telling you that you don't want to leave here without it. And for Christians that are in this room today, You don't have the strength to walk out of this building on your own and face this subject we talked about today. You don't have it because inside of us, we are weak and made of flesh. Your strength comes from the Lord and that's where you need to turn your head to today. That's where you need to turn your heart to today and ask him to empower you so that you can go out here and represent him for the sake of not only you, but your children, and your grandchildren, and all those in society that you don't want to be separated from God because you love them. Stand with me, please. We're going to be singing page 291. 291.
Today we have uh, several families that have come forth that want to join the church, and uh, they've been coming here a long time, and um, they've came and met with me. We've talked about uh, the covenant of the church. Um, we've had our meeting together, and they've been faithful, uh, faithfully coming here for you know quite a while. And I've told them, you know, we're not looking really to gain numbers. We're looking to to strengthen the body of Christ. And so they come today seeking membership of the church and. Uh, each time I meet with someone, you know, I'm able to, to go over and make sure, first of all, they've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Secondly, uh, that um, they have uh, been obedient to follow Him in baptism. If not, then we, we explain the baptism. Um, uh, thirdly, that they want to be an active part of the church, uh, not just a name on the roll, but that they want to come in because there's people that they can reach that I can't reach. There's, that's the way the body strengthens one another. And that... Uh, that most of all, we believe the same way. That's what makes the church body, people that believe the same way. So today, uh, we've got two different families that are coming. First of all, this is Greg and Sharon Fowler, and uh, they come by statement of faith and, uh, and by letter. Today, wanting to join the church, you've seen them here for years. Uh, so it's about time they join. And um, you know, I, I had a good time just being able to talk to them and see their love for the church, and they come today seeking membership of the church, accepting the covenant of the church. Greg, is there anything that you want to say or share? Uh, we, uh, we've had the uh, opportunity to do quite a bit of traveling, some of which was our choice, and some of it was just kind of pushed on us. And in those travels, we had the opportunity to go to a lot of different churches. We saw a lot of churches that on the outside looking in, they looked great. And we saw those same churches fall. I never could put my finger on why we just kept getting called back here. But uh, we've just been covered up with love here. <clears throat> we've always felt comfortable here. Amen. And uh, I think it's Matthew 18, 19 that says that if only two people can come together in agreement, that uh, God will bless other people as long as they have hope the same belief. And Amen. If the power is just within two people. I think that's the secret of this church because everybody, there's no strife, there's no, there's no uh, discontent here, and it's just been amazing how this church has changed our lives. Amen. We, Amen. We love it. Amen. Well, we're glad to have y'all. Anything? Okay. Well, this is Greg and Sharon Fowler, and uh, they come seeking membership of the church today. Um, if you would love them and in turn let them love you, if you would serve with them and in turn let them serve with you, uh, them coming in accepting the covenant of the church, it would be on your agreement. If you would have them to be members of the church, would you please say amen? amen. Any opposed? Always have to ask. That could be somebody out there. All right. So uh, we welcome them as members. And after our deacon ordination service today, we're going to be out there shaking hands and and so uh, it's just good to have them here as part of it. And as Greg talked about, um, we're still a group of people, a bunch of misfits. I've told all y'all to begin with, we all bring our, our baggage and everything in here. So uh, the content, the contentiousness, there's, there is always um, uh, that lurking by the devil that wants to be able to break this up. So we have to stand on guard against it. So um, the next family that comes, this is Don and Tracy Mahaffey. And, um, and a lot of you have asked how to pronounce her name. It is Tracy. So uh, they come, and uh, they've been visiting with us since around Christmas, right? First of the year. First uh, sunny November last yeah. year. Okay, around November of last year. And what a blessing. And um, they've come in and just been those faithful people that you, that you see whenever the doors are opened. And, and this is uh, their daughter, Haley. And uh, Haley's been a blessing. I've enjoyed the time I've got to spend with her. And... Uh, you know, she's one of those young mothers in the church. We love her child, and uh, we love having her here. And uh, they come seeking membership in the church, uh, all professing the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and following the Lord in, baptize, uh, in baptism. And, you know, Haley was baptized uh, in our last baptism service, so uh, uh, they come today. We've had the same meeting together. Uh, what a joy it was to, to know that they want to be a part of this. So, Don, is there anything that you want to say? Sure. Um, I'm going to stand close because <clears throat> my mic okay. will pick you up. And we came in here from, from a world like, uh, what a fitting sermon we had today, uh, a world of confusion and uh, 
where the, the boundaries are changing as whoever's in authority. And when we came into this church and the first time and we stood back there and pastor got up and said, if you have your Bible, hold it up. And we stood up and we had our Bibles and we held our Bibles up and I felt the Holy Spirit Amen. in this place. Amen. And that's what I was looking for, not to wonder what the rule was going to be next or whose opinion was going to be held in highest esteem, but that this church held the word of God in authority, singly. And, um, it's been just a blessing. And, and I was looking for a church where you know, I was just saved five and a half years ago. And since then, I've been growing in knowledge and trust and faith and obedience. And I was looking for a body of believers who wanted to do that same thing. And Amen. as individuals, and not only as individuals, but as a church, grow in obedience and trust and faith Amen. and love. Amen. And I found that here. Praise God. I Amen. found that here. Amen. And I came in and I heard people saying, Amen. Listen to John over there right now. Amen. And you know what I found out? I'm one of those Amen people too. Didn't even know it. But I find myself saying Amen and praising God. And I came from a church where you didn't say anything. That's all my life. I, I came from that. So what a blessing. What a blessing to, to hear the word of God preached like it is the truth, the meat. Uh, preached up here every Sunday. What church would not be glorified by having a pastor like this stand up there and preach the word of God? Amen. And not only that, we've got two of them. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Pastor Blake stood up there in his absence, and I'm like, man, what a Amen. miracle to Amen. have two pastors Glory to God. like this in a church. Like, Praise Amen. God. This, this place is blessed. And, I, and, and to kick off in Awanas, strong women of God, standing up there ready to lead our children in the ways of righteousness and bring them up with the Bible and authority. Amen. Praise Amen, God. God. Obedient men, deacons. I saw testimonies. Wow. Never witnessed anything like that in my life. Praise God. Amen. Wow. Amen. I'm just so happy to be a part of it. we just just so happy. And the Lord has just filled my heart with joy and peace Amen. while we're finding this church. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Glory to God, Don. You're going to preach or something? <laughs> Bump that air down one. Put it down to 72. Please. I'm serious. It's hot up here now. <laughs> Glory to God. That's uh, families that come in and are, are excited about being a part of a body. Well, that's when you'll, you'll see them be faithful to the body. So uh, today, uh, Don and Tracy and Haley come seeking membership of the church, accepting the covenant of the church, believing like the church believes. If you would accept them as members of this church to love them and in turn let them love you to serve with them and in turn let them serve with you, would you please say amen? amen. Any opposed? Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to ask them to go sit down. Um, the last part of our service is a deacon ordination service. And for those of you that are saying, well, um, this is about what time we usually end our regular service. Um, you're right. And this deacon ordination service is a pretty important service because you have men in the church that have answered the call to serve in the role of deacon. And those that have answered uh, the call to serve in the role of deacon are the Bible tells us that we need to pray over them. Uh, we have one that has never served before, and he needs to be ordained as a deacon. This is a service to where we have them and their wives come up front, and we're able to see what the Scripture says and then pray over them as they sit in chairs. And I invite anybody that, who is an, an ordained deacon uh, uh, as a man, ordained deacon, or a male pastor, I invite them to come and pray uh, over them and um, and so I'm going to ask at this time maybe uh, and this is important it's not just the people that are coming to pray it's the church members that are praying also uh, because these are going to be the the deacons that are going to be serving this body of Christ but I know that it's a it's a part of the service if you're if you won't be praying and sitting out there that um, I don't want you to uh, 
to stay here if you have been here long enough and you need to go for some kind of physical reason or um, you're not a member of the church, you're not interested in seeing it, and uh, we understand that, but uh, we want you to be a part of it. So at this time, as those deacons come, I'm going to ask um, uh, Blake and Greg if you can set these chairs um, out, um, set four on this side, or however you want to do it. There's uh, chairs right back here in the back, and um, if you can set those out, I would ask the the, uh, the deacons and their wives to come up and take a seat in these. Or actually stand in front of them facing me. And all those that need to leave at this time, uh, please excuse yourself. Those that choose to stay, um, then we'll continue with our service during this brief interim of about a minute. I'll just play something. Thank you for staying. We're a baseball family. We talk a lot about baseball. We love baseball. Kids play baseball. I've set tons of baseball games. Anytime we go into extra innings, instead of looking at it as a bad thing, we look at it as free baseball. This is free church. All right? What I'm saying is, yeah, uh, it, it doesn't bother us to do something else longer. This is important stuff. This is the body of the church, so thank you. Um, today we have five deacons that are going to be taking the, the role of deacon, the office of deacon in this church. We have lost a, a valuable part of the church this year. God called him home. That was Bob Lohman. He was serving as deacon. We have Scott Leslie. He was at the early service. I don't see him here now. We have Reggie White, who is in the back. We have Donald Dover, who is in the back. And we have Brad Miller. Brad Miller's in the back. These men have served faithfully, and they'll be stepping out of their position. We elected, as the church, five men. Glenn Baker, Mike Cruz, Anthony Cardona, Dalton Looney, and Daryl Shelby to take the position of deacon, but they, they gave themselves to answer God's call. Mike is not here today. He has served as deacon before, has been ordained before. So has Daryl, so has Anthony, so has Dalton. Today we will have an ordination service. We call it ordination service, and Glenn will be the one being ordained, but we will still pray over all of these men and their wives because it is the job of the men and their wives to serve in this capacity. The Bible says in the book of Acts, chapter 6, this happened to the church as the church began to grow in number. It said, in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. As you heard about Don talking about there was no contention in the church. Well, I'm going to tell you, if there's any contention in the church, the first person it's going to be against is the pastor. Because the pastor can only be at so many places at, at one time. So God instituted deacons in the church to be able to hold up the hands of the pastor and do those things. 
Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and they said, It's not reason that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. Wherefore the brethren, look among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom they appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer in the ministry of the word. And that's what the pastors are supposed to be doing. I believe in pastors visiting, no, but I believe that you have to make your priority the Word of God, the reading of the Word of God, the studying the Word of God in prayer. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, the proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. And here's what happened. It says, and the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. We do that today in recognition of the biblical example here. We bring these men and their wives in front of us, and we pray over them. In a moment, we'll ask those that, that are ordained deacons or ministers to, to come and pray over them. Uh, realize that uh, do be considerate. Make your prayer direct and concise. I'm not trying to say don't ramble in your prayer, but I'm saying these people are going to be here, these people are here, so come and pray over them in earnestness to God and say what you need to say to God. But by all means, have your spirit come together and seek what God would do with these people in our church. The act of setting one apart for service in an office of leadership in the church ministry, that's ordination. We read Acts 6, but Acts 14, 23, we see that when they had ordained the elders in these churches and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So today, even though these deacons have been ordained before, I, I still think the pledge is appropriate that they would give to God and to you. So today I would ask all of you that stand here, knowing, Glenn, that this is your ordination service also. I would say you've answered the call and the opportunity to serve in the office of deacon in this church family. And the church has prayed and elected you as deacons in this body. I would ask you, do you promise to this body of Christ and also to God to serve in this role, continually strengthening yourself spiritually with faithfulness to God and to this church body, looking for God, looking to God for your direction? If you promise to this body of Christ and also to God to serve in this role, continually strengthening yourself, your family, and strengthening it with faithfulness to God and faithfulness in this church body and promise to look to God for your direction, would you please say, I will? Daryl, as we pray over you and Cindy today, we'll pray God's blessing, his strength, his awareness of things so that you can be able to speak to the people that you need to speak to and minister the way that you need to minister. Anthea, as we pray over you and Kelly today, we will pray that God strengthens you in these same ways. Dalton, as we pray over you and Joey today, we will pray that God strengthens you in these same ways. Glenn, for you and Lisa, we will pray in the same way, even knowing that you're ordained in this service. You're a child of God, and God will reveal to you the things that you need to do. Do you promise to this church body and to God that you will serve in this role faithfully? Lisa, do you promise that as his wife that you will serve in the areas that you can serve to help him do this job? Amen. Dalton and Joey, do you promise that you will faithfully serve in this role? Anthony and Kelly, do you promise that you will faithfully serve in this role? Daryl and Cindy, do you promise you will faithfully serve in this role? You said you've asked them twice. I ask them as a group and I ask them independently because... God makes everything personal. And not only do they promise to God and promise to this church, they promise to me. It's my job to hold them accountable. It's their job to hold me accountable. So today, I would like to pray as a church body with you. And then I would like for you to be seated and have those that want to come and pray, pray over you. So pray with me. Father God, I love you. I praise you and I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for those who have been willing to serve. I thank you, Lord, for a church that prayerfully considered who it is that they wanted to serve. I thank you, Lord, for having your will and way. 
And I pray, God, that you would take each man and his wife and let them be able to minister to families in this church in ways that no one else could minister. Give them, Lord, that desire, that strength, that faithfulness to continually be in prayer to you on behalf of the families, be in fellowship and contact with the families, and, Lord, to communicate with me, Lord, so that the sheep of this sheepfold, Lord, will be protected and cared for. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd ask you to take a seat if you would. I would ask at this time all those that uh, would like to come and pray over them. I ask any uh, deacon, any uh, ordained deacon, whether you're a part of this church or another church or ordained pastor, if you would like to come and pray over them, we would like you to. And if you're not, then please feel free to pray at this time uh, from where you're at. Ask God on their behalf in their service to this church. Vicki, if you would like to play something.
I really appreciate the patience and the respect you were able to show this morning on behalf of these men and their wives and respect for the service. I do want to present Glenn with this. It is a certificate of ordination. It will be complete once Brad signs it. So Brad will sign that for you as chairman of, of the deacons. Um, at this time, uh, you guys can go back to your seats. And um, you'll be able to dismiss with everybody else. <laughs>